Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction. I'm going to dive right into it. What's the fuss about fats? OK? So what is the fuss? What is the fuss? Why is such a big fuss about fats? So we, this is going to be two parts. I'm going to show you slides. But first, I'm going to draw you a picture. Because fats are not just fats, OK? There's a different kind of fat in different parts of your body. And people just think fats are fats, but they're not. There's different kinds of fats. There's all sorts of different kinds of fats. So let's take an artery. I'm going to draw you an artery first. Let's have a better artery than that. Let's draw a better artery. There we go. Now, this artery can be any part of your body. And plaque starts growing in it, right? Your coronary arteries, let's say. And you have hardening of the arteries. So you say, oh, you got all this calcium built up in the walls of the arteries. Now, look where I'm drawing the calcium. The buildup of plaque, it's on the outside. But wait a second, I got blocked inside arteries. Well, it does grow inside too, but it only grows a little bit. Most of it is actually on the outside of the artery. Okay? So what's wrong if it's all growing on the outside of the artery? Well, what's wrong is that it can also grow inward, and when it grows inward, once it starts narrowing the artery down, now the blood flow gets reduced. Now, this is calcium. And that's the calcium score that all of you do. But there's something else. There are islands of plaque here that are not calcified. Then this is a normal part of the artery. And then again, there's calcium buildup over here. So what's going on here? What's the difference between this part and this part? This here is called soft plaque. This is called hard plaque. So the problem with this is it causes obstruction. The problem with soft one, what's in it? Fat. What kind of fat? Bad fat. What is bad fat? It's fat that is made up of LDL. Well, you all know about LDL, low-density lipoproteins. But again, it's not just your total LDL. This thing is made up of small, dense LDL, abnormal LDL. So you all have a high LDL. They have a low LDL. Is there a difference in your heart attack rates? No, there isn't. In spite of what all the literature will tell you and what your doctors will tell you. More than 50% of the patients who have heart attacks have normal LDLs. Then how can they be having heart attacks? How can LDL be causing heart attacks? What is a heart attack? Now I'm going to show what is a heart attack. This thing ruptures, a blood clot forms on it. If the blood clot is small, he won't even know. It'll get covered over, and now he's getting a little bit of plaque formation. But if the blood clot is big, now he'll start having chest pain because the blood is not moving through. And if he's really unlucky, the blood clot is a big blood clot. And now the artery is completely shut down. So this plaque over here, the soft one, can rupture. Why would it rupture? Why would it suddenly crack like a pimple on the inside of the artery? It's because it's made up of fat, and this fat is the wrong kind of fat. It's inflammatory fat. Think of a pimple. It's inflammatory. It's got pus in it, right? This is pus in the artery. When we do a biopsy of this, this is what you're going to find. You're going to find in it lots and lots of fat globules. And you're going to find in it T cells. B cells, which are inflammatory cells as part of your white cells, right? Your immune system. Lots and lots of T cells, lots and lots of B cells. And you're going to find here macrophages. That's your white cells, your WBCs, right? That go out and kill bacteria and kill viruses and kill foreign particles. What are they doing here? Why are they fighting a war in here? Why? Who are they fighting against? Who are the T cells and the B cells producing cytokines that are going to produce matrix metalloproteinase and break this down, and suddenly this thing is going to break open, and now a blood clot will form there? What's it fighting against? It's fighting against something foreign. What is that foreign stuff? Plague. What is it? 
This foreign stuff is this fat here. And what's this fat made up of? It's made up of damaged LDL. Damaged LDL, not regular LDL. Damaged LDL. So if you look at people who have damaged LDL, they are going to have this. And when there's enough damaged LDL and enough inflammation, if you get enough inflammation in here, the wall here is going to break down. And when that wall breaks down, the blood that's going past here is going to make a blood clot on it. So you've got to make sure that your plaques don't have inflammation in it. Therefore, what's going to cause the inflammation is small, dense LDL, abnormal LDL particles. These are abnormal LDL particles. So how do you make abnormal LDL particles? Well, if you do the advanced lipid test, it will tell you the sizes of your LDL. So you put it through the test and say, oh, here's a peak of LDL of this size. And then you're going to get small, dense particles. So you're going to get another peak, another peak, and another peak. These are abnormal LDL particles. They've been damaged. Damaged by what? What's damaging the LDL that now, instead of having all the LDL particles being of the same size, now you're getting smaller ones and even smaller ones. What's the difference between these and these and these? What's the difference? What the difference is, is the fats in it. So these LDL particles have cholesterol in them. They're fatty acids. Okay? And then they have lipoproteins on them. So these are little balls, lipoproteins on top of them. So they all have cholesterol. But what's the difference between these is the constitution of the fatty acids. What is a fatty acid? It's a glycerol body with three fatty acids attached to it, three fatty acids. So this is a triglyceride, a triglyceride. It has three fatty acids on them. And this is the glycerol body. That's a triglyceride. So all these are triglycerides inside the LDL. There's cholesterol also. What's the culprit? The culprit is your triglycerides. So if you have large fluffy particles and your triglycerides, the fatty acids are good saturated fatty acids, then this molecule is not going to be inflammatory. It's not going to be small dense. It's not going to be deranged. What we now know is that abnormal LDL is created when these fatty acids are wrong. What's wrong with fatty acids? Well, first of all, you're eating the wrong fatty acids. Secondly, you're oxidizing them inside you. I'll show you. So you may be eating even good ones, but then you're ruining it. How are you ruining them? By eating too much sugar and by overcooking your food, overheating your food. Now these fatty acids which you took in, OK, I was very good. I didn't eat bad fatty acids. I ate good ones. But you destroyed them through the cooking process. And you destroyed them because your glucose was too high. What's wrong with glucose? Well, it attaches itself to the fatty acids, and these fatty acids change. So when you get these abnormal LDL particles, now along comes a white cell, and it wants to gobble it up. Because to it, it's an abnormal particle. It wants to take it out of circulation. And these are what end up in the soft plaque, because it's trying to get out of the circulation. So macrophages attach themselves over here, they go inside, and when the macrophages die, the macrophages are your white cells that have collected all these bad LDLs. And when they die, they liberate the calcium, and that's the calcium you see. They liberate the fat, and there's the fat. It's the bad LDL that's inside the plaque. So yes, the plaques do contain fat. They contain cholesterol, 
But the abnormal thing in it is the fatty acid that either you ate or you created inside you. So that's why we're talking today about fats. Because the type of fat is really important because there's fats in every cell of your body. But you want fats that are stable, not unstable. Now, you all know about rancidity, right? Mm -hmm. So if a fat is rancid, what's wrong? It's gone bad. It's become oxidized, right? So you want LDL that contains the right type of fat in it. So let's talk about those types of fat, because that's going to be what's going to generate inflammation, because you're going to generate small, dense LDL. And the small, dense LDL becomes the target of your immune system. You're going to get soft plaque. When you get soft plaque, you can crack it, break it, and then you get a blood clot. Now you're having a heart attack. Or you can break it, but it heals over, and you're getting more atherosclerotic progression. So you're getting more and more hardening of the arteries. So can we monitor this? Sure we can. We do CT scans. You can see how much calcium there is. We can also do now fractional flow reserve that tells us whether this calcium is narrowing the artery or not. And we can also, on the CT scan, look for soft plaque. So let's say you get a CT scan, and you have only calcium only. And it's not causing a narrowing. You pass your stresses, you feel good. But you don't have soft plaque. You're better off than that guy over there who has calcium, but he also has 50% of his plaque is soft, full of fat. It's going to break and cause a heart attack. He's in trouble. You may not be in that much trouble. So the plaque characteristics have to be determined. Until now, we didn't have tools to look for plaque characteristics. But now on CT scan using AI, finally we have a good use for AI, <laughs> right? So finally, these images are sent to California, and they do a complete analysis on the arteries. And you can tell you, you got so much calcified plaque, you got so much non-calcified plaque. And from that, you can, there's also a term called hyperlucent plaque. That means a plaque that has, is very lucent. So it's got a very, very low Hounsfield unit on CT. What that basically means is that it's full of fat, and it's the bad kind of fat. So those plaques are very vulnerable. We've been looking for this holy grail for 30 years to find plaques that you know are going to rupture that patient's in trouble. So he may be feeling good right now, but you better put him on an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, anti-inflammatory diet, because he's going to rupture that plaque. So you got an idea about LDL. It's not your total LDL, because if you have large, fluffy LDL particles, then your risk is not that high. But if you have small, dense particles, then you're in trouble. So now the rest of the talk is going to be about what makes those particles small and dense. So I'm going to give you a primer here, because there are many factors that make that LDL become small and problematic for you. So if you look at that LDL particle, LDL floats around the body. And here's your gut. If foreign materials get through your gut, known also colloquially as leaky gut, then these things that cross over, they call LPS, lipopolysaccharides. These lipopolysaccharides, I'm going to draw them as a little dot. They can't free float in the body because they are fat soluble. The blood can't have globules of fat floating around, right? So what, they, what these little globules do, they get taken up by LDL. So LDL comes along, and it takes up the lipopolysaccharide. The lipopolysaccharide is an abnormal particle. This comes from the gut. It's part of the bacteria. Now this LDL has this particle on it. What's happened to the size of the LDL? It's become small and dense. Do you see it? It's a deranged LDL particle. Your LDL became damaged. So that's one cause if you have a leaky gut. Another cause of damaged LDL, glucose. So this is one scenario. <clears throat> scenario number two, here's your LDL, minding its own business. But you go and eat too much sugar, because you love sugar. 
and you're getting spikes in your blood sugar, it glycates the lipids that are in the LDL. So glucose attaches itself to this. And you all know about this because you measure your hemoglobin A1C. What is hemoglobin A1C? It's the hemoglobin and sugar is attached to it now. Well, you think sugar only attaches itself to hemoglobin A1C? No, it attaches to every cell, every protein, every LDL molecule. The sugar attaches itself. That's why sugar is so bad for you. Look, if you really want to know how long you're going to live and how healthy you're going to live, you better know what your sugar levels are. Your fasting sugar is one of the most predictive of who's going to live a healthy life and how long you're going to live is your fasting sugar. If you tell me, oh, my fasting sugar is fine, it's 110, not bad. No, it's too high. It needs to be less than 95. Less than 90 is even better. So you, you got to answer, why is glucose bad for you? Because when the blood sees a lot of glucose, every lipid in your body is going to get glycated. Every protein gets glycated. What do you mean by glycated? That means the sugar attaches itself to it. That's why glucose is so bad. If you really want to know what's going on in your bodies, and if you're really concerned about your health, you should also do continuous glucose monitoring so that if your glucose is doing this after each meal, and say, oh, my A1C is fine. I'm not a diabetic, but my sugars are fluctuating all the time. Every time it goes up, it's glycating the lipid in your LDL and your LDL becomes damaged. Plus, every protein in your body gets damaged as well. Everything gets damaged by the high sugar. The higher the sugar, every molecule in your work can't work properly. Every protein cannot work properly because it's glycated. So glycation also destroys the LDL particle, the LDL particle. And don't think that glycation only occurs with proteins, which is what many people think. Glycation occurs with lipids as well. So a lipid molecule, fat, gets attached to sugar. Now, I'll show you why the type of fat is very important. Because if you take a saturated fat and put sugar on it, it's not going to affect it that much. Because there's no bonds there that are open for interaction. But if you take a bad type of fat, and now you put sugar over there, now you've got double whammy. Not only is the sugar there, but you also got the bad type of fat, a fat that's polyunsaturated. That's what we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So I'm giving you a little clue as to why your LDLs get bad and damaged, because you got a leaky gut. And many people will disagree with me on this, but this is a proven fact. Number two, glycation. Glycation. Glycation is really bad. And the third thing. It's oxidation of the LDL. Oxidation due to oxidative stress. So that's heavy metals that cause oxidative stress in the body. So there's lots of other reasons too, but for the talk tonight, I just want you to know that healthy fats, they find it very difficult to become oxidized. But bad fats, which I'm going to show you today, are the ones that get easily damaged by lipopolysaccharides and by glucose. So let's dive into the fat, and I'll show you that. Let's put the screens down for a second now. And I'm going to start with the slides and show you the data on the fats and why they're important. All right. So let's take vegetable oils, because that's what today's talk is about. You have saturated fat, monounsaturated fat, and polyunsaturated fat. I want you to remember this now. Saturated fat, mono, and polyunsaturated. What is polyunsaturated? That means they have lots of empty spaces in there that can interact with other things. It's not a stable molecule. Monounsaturated means that they have one bond available for attachment and interactions. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. All right? So soybeans has 18% saturated fat, monounsaturated 24%, but look, a 58% polyunsaturated fat in it. So these fat molecules, so now I told you about lipopolysaccharides, didn't I? I just told you about sugar just now. And I told you about oxidative stress that occurs in the body, the rusting process, the Maillard reaction, all these other things that happen. Who's, which one of these three 
constitutions of soybean is going to get affected by what I showed you earlier on. This one. That's what's going to get damaged. So you want your cells, your red cells, for example, or you want your proteins, or you want your other molecules your, to be, to, to the LDLs especially, to be composed of this, or this, or this. If you have a lot of this in your body, all your LDLs will readily interact, readily oxidize, and readily become small dense particles, and your whole body, everything will readily interact. You're inflamed. Your immune system will see that all your fats are deranged. Oh my God, they're so easily damaged because they're full of polyunsaturated fats. Let's take canola oil. Oh, very healthy. Where did this come from? <laughs> this came from Canada. Thanks, Canadians. They gave us canola oil. OK? So canola oil has a lot of monounsaturated fats. So you'll say, oh, it's better than soybean oil. Yes, it is. It is in that regard. But it's still bad, because it has one bond that can still interact. And remember something else, the processing of these things, the processing of bean, soybean oil and canola oil requires so many chemicals, and traces of those chemicals are still in the oil, especially like things like hexane gases. If you see where they make these oils, it, you'd think that you are, you are on the coast of India in one of the biggest uh, oil refineries. That's what it looks like. It looks like an oil refinery. So you want to eat those products that are made in a refinery? Is that where you're getting your food from, a refinery? Grapeseed oil, 70% polyunsaturated. Yet I know people who say grapeseed oil is very healthy for you. It's not. Olive oil, 74% monounsaturated, still has 9% polyunsaturated and 17% saturated fat. So look. It's not too different from canola, but olive oil still has monounsaturated fat. It's, olive oil is not a health oil. But given a choice of which poison you're going to choose and put on your plate today, because you have to, let's say, then you'd rather choose some olive oil. But it's still a poison. And I'll show you lots of studies. I have tons of studies to show that people who are divided into olive oil versus saturated fats, olive oil did worse. Olive oil is not a health food. Now, I put it in my salad, a little bit. But I know people who take five tablespoons a day, thinking that they're healthy because of the Mediterranean diet. <laughs> Look, it's a lie. The whole Mediterranean diet thing is a lie. Because if you go back and look at the data, those studies were done in Crete. So in Crete at the time, it was right after World War, these people were starving. They were eating mostly vegetables and scraps left over and a little bit of meat here and there. And they had olive oil. So the studies, these guys come along, people like Ansel Keys and them, and they say, oh, they had longevity. It must be the olive oil. It's not the olive oil. It was because they were living like paupers. Now, if you go to Crete today, the diet has completely changed. It's full of saturated fats. They have one of the most obese populations now, and they have a very high incidence of coronary artery disease. It had nothing to do with olive oil. And besides which, I want you all to think about it. Let's say that you come and see me, and you say, Dr. J, what kind of diet should I be on? I say, you should be on a Mediterranean diet. You don't even know what a Mediterranean diet is, because you're Indian. <laughs> How is an Indian supposed to cook like a Mediterranean diet? Just doesn't make any sense. The poor Chinaman came the other day, and he's from China, and he's saying, I don't know what you're saying, Doc. Doesn't make sense. Coconut oil. Coconut oil is mostly saturated. It has some monounsaturated, very little polyunsaturated oil. But I want to tell you something about olive oil, I mean, about uh, coconut oil. Coconut oil comes in two varieties, and you need to know this. One is extra virgin, and one is refined. Now, when you go get your olive oil, you get extra virgin, cold pressed. Why cold pressed? Because it doesn't take those fats and destroy them. Remember, when you're making canola oil and soybean oil and grapeseed oil, 
it goes up to 280 degrees at least twice in the processing of it all. You're creating a lot of damage to all those particles. Whereas when you take olive oil, it's cold pressed and it's extra virgin, it's going to be okay. There's not going to be many of those bad, deranged lipids in it. Coconut oil is the same way, if, but it's the opposite. You mustn't use, uh, you need to use extra refined, not extra virgin, because extra virgin has a lot of white stuff in it, which are called phytosterols. So phytosterols are not good for you. They cause coronary artery disease, and they crystallize inside your arteries. It's not a good idea to have too much phytosterols. Seeds have a lot of phytosterols. I'll show you a slide later on. But coconut oil, you can get rid of the phytosterols if you get refined coconut oil. So I get refined coconut oil, so opposite of olive oil. Palm oil. Palm oil is very high in saturated fats. It has some monounsaturated fats and only 10% polyunsaturated. Palm oil is actually a saturated fat. A lot of people all over the world are beginning to use it now. Look at beef. Beef is 50% saturated only. Now, everyone thinks that beef is 100% saturated. It's not. Meat is not 100% saturated. It actually contains almost half monounsaturated. How many people know that? Very few people know that, right? Chicken breast has a lot of polyunsaturated fats. Why? Because they're feeding the chickens the wrong food. They give them corn when they're supposed to be eating cockroaches. <laughs> and other things, worms and bugs and all those kinds of stuff. So that's why they have such a high polyunsaturated. And chicken consumption has gone off the roof. And with it, they're getting a nice dose of antibiotics. Give the chicken antibiotics, they grow faster and quicker. So you're going to get all those antibiotics. Some of them used to get growth hormones. Now we don't. Hopefully we, we still don't. Yeah. Stop eating it. <laughs> Tell me. Look at fish. Fish is 40% saturated, 39% monounsaturated. Now many people think that, oh, fish is 80% polyunsaturated, I mean uh, monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. It's not. It's got 40% saturated fat in it. Look at whole milk, 62% saturated fat, 30% monounsaturated, and 4% polyunsaturated. So where are the bad boys over here? The bad boys are this. Soybeans, terrible. Grapeseed, very bad. Chicken breast, bad. OK? Let's look at this one. Now, what is this picture? Now, this picture is complicated, but it's quite simple as well. Glycerol aldehyde plus glucose, plus lipids, plus protein. Combination will produce advanced glycation end products. It's a big word, but just bear with me. Methyl glycosyl plus protein plus lipids. Acid aldehyde protein plus lipids. Notice that in all these bad reactions, there's one common thing in all of them is the lipid. So when the lipid, which is involved in just about everything in your body, everything, everything, lipids are involved. And if there's lipids there, there's a good chance it's going to be involved in the advanced glycation end products. These are not just from glycation only. It's also when lipids interact with other molecules, such as methylglyoxyl, which is produced in, in processed foods, acetaldehyde, which comes from alcohol. So let's say you just drink a lot of alcohol. It's a dark. I'm on an alcohol diet. OK, fine. <laughs> I'm not getting any fats in me. Then how did I get all that fat in my artery, in my liver, and all these things? Well, acetaldehyde combines with proteins and lipids and produces advanced glycation end products. Advanced glycation end products then causes redox potentials to change. It causes the reactive oxygen species, and it causes total malfunction in the body. Every cell in your body becomes dysfunctional because of this. This, of course, gives you the hangover the next day as well, right? That's what you're feeling from. Glyceraldehyde, same thing. Formation of advanced glycation end products there are three main ways that these bad boys get created. Sugar, and then fructose. Look, pay attention. Fructose. 
I'm a fructarian, I eat lots of fruit. Two fruits for breakfast, three fruits for lunch, another three fruit in the evening. And what happens? These people come to see me, and they're sick. They either have dementia, coronary artery disease, they've had a stroke, they're obese, they have fatty liver. Fruit should only be consumed occasionally. That too, whatever is in season, not something that was picked six months ago. Fruit, limit your fruit intake. Fructose, fructose, major pathway by which you get advanced glycation end products. So all these, all these affect your LDL particles, they affect your mitochondria, total body dysfunction. Now, look at this one here, lipid peroxidation. See, your fats in your body. Your fats, once they get oxidized, they produce advanced glycation end products. So fats, don't let your fats get oxidized. Now, which fats get oxidized? I showed you right in the beginning. Which fats get oxidized? Polyunsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats. Saturated fats cannot get oxidized. You can put a teaspoon of ghee on your, on your, on your plate, and it will be there a month later. It's still OK. It's still OK. It hasn't become rancid. You take a little bit of walnut oil, within one hour, it's rancid. You take any of the vegetable oils and leave them out in the open, in a matter of hours, they start going rancid. What does rancidity mean? That means they're getting oxidized. Do you want to consume fats that easily get oxidized? Because then you're going to get lipid peroxidation. That's going to cause advanced glycation end products. Or do you want to consume fats that are very stable in your body? and are not going to get oxidized. Oxidation is very important. Oxidation equals aging. Oxidation equals rusting. You're rusting. You want to rust quickly, or do you want to rust slowly? The difference is oxygenation. And oxygenating what? Lipids. You are as old as the rate at which you are oxidizing your lipids. So you better be careful what you do with the lipids outside in your kitchen and which ones you're consuming and putting inside your body. And once it's inside your body, you've got to also prevent oxidation by making sure your sugar levels are good and keeping that level nice and low. All right. So you see what I'm trying to give a picture here is? You know, we think aging is all about other things. I'm telling you, aging is multifactorial. But one of the major issues as to why you get sick and why you're getting old quickly and premature is because you're rusting. And you're rusting because the lipid peroxidation process has been unrecognized. Lipid peroxidation is unrecognized. Now we've got to put this on the map. Advanced glycation end products are harmful molecules. Look what they do in your body. Once you get these advanced glycation end products, in which fats are playing a huge role. Because with oxidative stress, inflammation, I told you if you have inflammation, your plaques are going to rupture. It causes apoptosis, which is cell injury and destruction. Premature aging, yeah, thank you. I'm trying to stay young. Give me some Botox. Uh, cardiovascular disease, get heart disease, right? I get a heart disease. Fatty liver. Do you know right now, two thirds of the population has a fatty liver? Fatty liver is caused by a lot of things. We know about this. It's either alcohol. We have too much insulin and sugar in your diet, right? We have too much fructose in your diet, or you have a leaky gut causing metabolic endotoxemia. These are the four major causes of a fatty liver, and you need to know about these things. Because if the doctor tells you you've got a fatty liver, you have trouble. Again, fatty, fatty. You see? See? It's got to do with fats. Look, don't think that fats are just for taste and everything. Fats are an integral part of your chemistry. Fats are an integral part of your chemistry. But nobody talks about that. Everyone talks only about sugar and proteins and minerals and vitamins and blah, 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 blah. They don't talk about the fats. Fats are actually very important. What, per what percentage of my brain is all fat? My brain is mostly fat. That's what it is. But it's the right type of fat for my brain to work properly. Saturated fats, cholesterol. Lots of cholesterol in my brain, yeah? Because if I only have polyunsaturated fats, I'm going to get advanced glycation end products. My neurons don't open, and then I get this early dementia. Neurodegenerative disease, there it is. 
a fast route if you want to get neurodegenerative disease. You want to get some Parkinson's, you want to get shaking, you want to get some dementia. Fine. Stuff yourself with polyunsaturated fats tomorrow. <coughs> Hypertension, renal failure, <laughs> insulin resistance, and pancreatic dysfunction. All these are caused by advanced glycation end products. They promote mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, your mitochondria, let me explain something about your mitochondria. <coughs> mitochondria are found in all cells of your body. I'm so tired all the time. Your mitochondria may not be working well. It's not because you're depressed. Now, the mitochondria has a lot of proteins in them, inside, and they have a lot of fats in them as well. So when you get the wrong types of fat in your mitochondria, you're going to get mitochondrial dysfunction. When you get mitochondrial dysfunction, you have no energy. If, mitochondria, if you don't get good mitochondrial function, you're going to get a lot of reactive oxygen species. You're going to get epigenetic changes. You're going to age quickly. You're going to get disease. You need good mitochondria. Mitochondria. Your mitochondria use what? What do the mitochondria love to use for energy? You're going to say sugar, 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 glucose. It's not. It's fat. It's fat. So. Reactive oxygen species, if you get mitochondrial dysfunction, you also get reactive oxygen species, nitrogen reactive species, so that makes your blood vessels all, con you get hypertension. You get hypertension. I see my patients and they have hypertension. They say, oh, it's essential hypertension. And then I change their fat intake, make them change the food, what they're eating. I make the sugars come down, make their insulin levels come down. I reduce their entire body fat constitution. And lo and behold, their blood pressures go away. We can treat high blood pressure, but it's hard work. Without drugs, we can do it. By the way, talking about that, I told you about polyunsaturated fats, right? If I give you some polyunsaturated fat right now, drink it up or in something, how long is that fat going to stay in your body? Take a guess. Five days. 600 days. Oh, the flowers. So you want a turnover. I want all my adipose tissue to be composed of saturated fat and not polyunsaturated fat, linoleic acid. I don't want linoleic acid in my body because that's a polyunsaturated fat. You're going to have to work hard. And don't think that you can do this in one week and now oh, my, my adipose tissue is now all healthy, non-inflamed adipose tissue. No. It may take up to two years. Depends, depends how much of it you got and whether the final expression of it depends on how much of it you have in you. So don't take it lightly. Because you may consume polyunsaturated fats and say, yeah, but I burnt it up. No, you didn't. You stored it, and it's going to be there for two years. <laughs> so extracellular damage, maturation, pro oh, collagen loss. Oh, let me tell you about collagen loss. You don't want wrinkles? Then don't have advanced glycation end products, because they destroy the collagen. They destroy collagen. So people who have a lot of advanced glycation end products, means the sugars are high. They have the wrong types of fats in their body. They have small, dense particles. They get wrinkles. They're basically getting old. The collagen's all gone. When the collagen's gone from your arteries, you get hardening of the arteries. You get diastolic dysfunction. You can get hypertension. Collagen, very important. Elastic tissue loss. It's part of the aging process. So these are the pathways which I told you about already. And these are the chemistries of it. And let's move on alcohol consumption I mentioned. Now, look at this. Endogenous production of advanced. Look, I put down alcohol, liver disease, cigarettes. Why are cigarettes so bad for you? Because they create advanced glycation end products. And look what else causes it. Omega-6 fatty acid diet. You have a high fatty acid diet, you're going to get a lot of advanced glycation end products, and you're going to get all the diseases that I've mentioned. So, you want to prevent endogenous glyc uh, glycation products. Keep your sugar low. I already told you that. If you have any doubt, do continuous glucose monitoring. You'll be surprised. So let me tell you. She came to me, and she eats potatoes. Her blood sugar didn't go up. She's not diabetic. Didn't go up. Her neighbor was eating the same potato. Her sugar went up to 200. She's not diabetic either. Both have the same hemoglobin A1c. What's the difference? You react differently to potatoes than she does. And vice versa, when she was eating, when she was drank skim milk, her sugars did not go down, but yours did. So everyone reacts differently. Why? Partly because of the microbiome that you have in you. And the only way you're going to know these differences is if you do your continuous glucose monitoring. So who should do continuous glucose monitoring? Where you put that little disc over here, and you're on your computer, you can see it. 
anyone who already has vascular disease, anyone who already has prediabetes, anyone with hyperinsulinemia, anyone with hypertension, anyone with a belly, anyone with a belly, if you have a belly, you need continuous glucose monitoring. End of story. OK? There you go. Because you know that what's driving this is a periodic increase in your glucose, which is causing insulin secretion. Insulin is a storage molecule. Between the two of them, they're going to cause fatty liver. And then the fat will go over into your omentum, and you'll get a big belly. You have a big belly, you already have insulin resistance. You already have it. You cannot afford to have a belly. You cannot have a belly. I'm just telling you right now. You want to stay healthy, you've got to get rid of it. Now, there are some people who have a belly, but they'll also have fat all over their body. And that's a small percentage of people. About 15% of people are metabolically healthy, obese people. So they have fat, but watch. Their fat is under the skin, and you can grab it. That's under the skin. But these people, the shit here, that have that big belly, hmm? Their fat is inside, so it's tight, <laughs> tight. When you, what you cannot grab is dangerous. So go home and try it out. Do your grab test. <laughs> or grab it on each other. <laughs> See, it's important. If you can grab your fat, you're in great shape. All right. Uh, not great shape, but... <laughs> OK, at least you're safer. Now, ages from exogenous. Now, this is very important for all of you. That means you can make these outside the body and consume it. So one, you made in your body because of glucose and the wrong types of fats that you consumed and everything. Now you made it in your body. Now you're going to consume it. Now, this got of my interest because a lot of people came to me and said, look, my diet is great. I'm only eating this now. I'm only eating this. I, I and then I look at them, and I say, you're still sick, though. You have small, dense LDL. You still have high blood pressure. You're making more disease. Your calcium score is going up. You're, What's going on? Why, is you, why are you still sick? Because by traditional ways, you should be now healthy. And then when I dug into the diet, I found out the following things. They were making exogenous products ages in the kitchen. Worse still, they were paying money to buy it and then go home and consume it. Now, how daft is that? 90% of it ends up in the colon, which affects your microbiome, which is not a good thing to do. 10% is absorbed into the body, 30% excreted into the urine. So what is it? It goes through your kidney. These things go to the kidney and then cause kidney problems. 60% of what is absorbed ends up in all the tissues. So let's talk about these. Um, let me skip this one. I'll come back to it. How do you produce exogenous these? You're frying it. You're broiling it. You're blackening it. You're charring it. You're baking it in cereals. These things all generate advanced glycation end products. Think about it. Think, just think about it. Of course you are. Because you're taking the food. You're destroying the food. You're destroying the food. Humans were not supposed to do these things. These activities were not part of human activity. <laughs> so, now, animal foods are naturally high because they themselves have advanced glycation on products. We all do, so long as you're alive. But processed foods, full of this, because they take it and they're putting it into the oven and they're making something out there in commercial ovens and whatnot. They're creating at high temperature the union. The union of what? Fats, glucose, and protein. And when you combine the three of them, what do you produce? Advanced glycation end products. Look, today you learned something new. You learned about advanced glycation end products. Did you ever, how many of you already heard about it before? One, two, bus. bus. <laughs> that's enough. Yes. Now that's a shame. No, no, that's a downright shame. Because the damage done in the body, whether it's due to glucose or whether it's due to eating bad, inside or outside, is all through advanced glycation end products. That's the pathway. And yet only two people knew about it. Because they think it's only about other things. They, 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 don't, they don't realize that it's also what you're making in the food in your kitchen or what you bought and paid money for it. 
So all processed foods are high in advanced glycation and because of the way they process it. Direct heating the food, broiling, air frying, air fry. Oh, I got an air fryer. Uh, <laughs> every Thanksgiving they buy a new one. Exactly. <laughs> so now, now you are forcing those molecules to combine. It's like welding. You want to weld your food? Huh? So you take in your protein, your, your sugar, and the fats, and you're welding them all together. Now tell me, how smart is that? Is that smart? Does nature do that? Nature doesn't do that. Because nature doesn't have the ability to go that high in its temperature either. Roasting, high temperature. Barbecue, high temperature. Baking, high temperature. So you're bringing these molecules in close proximity to each other, and you're creating advanced glycation end products. Now there's one big thing about them that's very good about advanced glycation end products. They taste terrific. <laughs> they do. Look at it. Check it out. It tastes fantastic, but it's deadly. It's, it's not dangerous. It's deadly. It'll kill you. It will kill you. Now, what's naturally low is naturally high carb foods are very low in advanced glycation end products. Like, for example, tubers. Okay, it comes from under the ground potatoes. They are high carb foods, but they're very low in advanced glycation end products. So if you're not a diabetic, you can have carbs. Naturally high water content foods. So water, water is really, really important. When you take these things, the sugar, the protein, and the oil, but if you have water with it, you get less advanced glycation end products. So how are you going to make your meat with chicken or your vegetables is you stew it. What's the maximum temperature of water? 100 degrees centigrade. You can't go higher. So our ways of making curry and cooking was the right way. But of course, we used to be much smarter now. Of course, we air fry them. <laughs> and we bake everything. And we stir fry, and we do all these crazy things. With our... So foods that are high in phytonutrients, which are all your polyphenols, those are, so why are polyphenols so good? Polyphenols found in vegetables of different colors and everything. They're good for two reasons. One, they feed the good bacteria in your gut, the polyphenols, and this, which are flavonoids and all these bioflavonoids. And the second reason, when you get absorbed into your body, they discourage the formation of advanced glycation end products. So the smartness was always there, that eat foods that are high in phytonutrients, such as what? such as putting what's that stuff, cilantro on your food and parsley and using spices, such as what? Turmeric, curcumin. Huh? What, are the, what do they do? What do they do? They discourage the formation of advanced glycation end products because they are high in phytonutrients. You see the wisdom of eating? Yeah, got to eat right with the right condiments that go with it. Then you can offset some of the poison, right, by using this. And of course, uncooked vegetables are very low in advanced glycation end products because you, you've uncooked them. There's, there's no advanced glycation. You creating the advanced glycation end products when you take your bindi and you, you burn the heck out of it. Black. The bindi is black. And now you're saying, oh yeah, I'm a vegetarian, you know, I have no problem. By the way, 70% of Indians are vegetarians and yet they are the kings of coronary artery disease. India is now the capital for coronary artery disease. And 70% of them are vegetarians. What are they doing? Two wrong things, sugar and wrong fats. Because they're having vanaspati ghee, vegetable oils, because we don't eat ghee anymore. Because we follow the Americans, saturated fats are bad for you. All that bad propaganda that you heard about and you're still concerned about. Because people come to my office all the time and say, yeah, well, I did what you did, but my LDL went high. And I said, yeah, but your particle sizes are all big and fluffy now. Your triglycerides have come down. Your HDL has gone up. Your hemoglobin A1C has come down to less than 5.4. Your blood pressure is gone. You're not on sugar diabetes medicines. Your fatty liver is gone. You feel better. You look better. But your LDL went up. <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you something. These articles that just came up in the last three months. Of course, we can talk for hours on this, but I don't have time for this. 
But the articles came out showing that the higher the LDL, the longer you're going to live. Now you're going to say, but Dr. J, that's impossible because every time I go to my doctor, he looks at my LDL and tells me I need to be on a statin to bring it down. And don't tell me that hasn't happened. It's probably happened to half of you over here. And in fact, he'll probably threaten to get rid of you if you don't follow his advice. But there's more to it than meets the eye. It's not just the total LDL. You should be looking at the whole picture. Is my LDL damaged? If it is damaged, it's not the LDL that's, that needs to come down. It's the cause of the damage that needs to come down. Do you see how I look at an advanced lipid panel? How does Dr. J look at an advanced lipid panel? If you have small dense LDL, you have pattern B. That means you have deranged LDL. So you don't go and chase the LDL to make it come down. No, you chase the cause of what made that LDL become small dense. I told you there's a number of things. One is sugar, so I'm going to be doing a craft test on it. Check your sugar and your insulin levels. Number two, I'm going to be seeing how much polyunsaturated fat you have. So in the advanced lipid panel, I get this test called your linoleic acid level. And if your linoleic acid level is very high, you've been cheating. You've got vegetable seed oils in you. Now, the upper limits for linoleic acid, the, thank goodness, you know what the government did? They raised your levels. Because when they look at the average population, they're all eating vegetable seed oils. Today, at the turn of the century, less than 3% of your entire energies would come from polyunsaturated fats. Today, 20 to 30% of the calories in many of the populations in America is coming from fats. The bad ones, the polyunsaturated fats. It's terrible. See? So it's very important that you understand what I'm saying because it's going to change your whole future. How you shop, how you cook, and look at the overall picture. When you look at the advanced lipid panel, you must ask for that in your doctor's office. When you look at your advanced lipid panel, you got to look at your particle sizes. You got to look at your omega-3, lipoprotein little a, CRP level, to get a better idea where you are, and your linoleic acid. Then you make a decision. And usually, reducing LDL is not the solution. The solution is to improve your triglycerides. So if you look at the risk of heart disease, you know we talk about hazard ratios, right? The hazard ratio for high LDL is one3 Nine. That means you have a 29% increase as compared to the other people around you. High triglycerides, it's 1.8. So which one do you want to bring under control? It's your triglycerides. And how do you bring triglycerides? What is triglyceride? I told you in the beginning, if you all paid attention, yeah, triglycerides are the glycerol with three fatty acids there, right? You've got to get those boys down. And you've got to make sure that the right boys are on that triglyceride. Right? The right type of fatty acids. All right. So let's look at this. Burgers and chicken nuts. This is the units of advanced glycation of processed cheese. Look how much. By the way, your daily recommended allowance that the government is telling us is 15,000. Well, all you have to do is you go eat some Kentucky Fried Chicken and you'll get 8,000, right? Right there. Poached is less than 1,100. Raw chicken is less than 800. Actually, I don't know if Kentucky fries is there. But all fried chicken is very high because you're generating. You're forcing that reaction. High temperature. High temperature plus oil plus protein plus sugar. The sugar and everything. You're making these reactions. Margarine. Margarine is 7,000. Why? Because that's already hydrogenated. You've already made that under high pressure. You created advanced glycation end products. Butter has a lot in three ounces, but who has three ounces? I mean, good God. <laughs> I'm not going to eat that much butter. Breakfast bar, your healthy breakfast bar. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm staying at this hotel, and in the morning I went down. I was so good. I just had a breakfast bar. You know, I took one of those. <laughs> I got to go for my meeting now. I took my computer, and off I went. How smart was that? <laughs> Processed cheese, burgers, chicken nuggets, all of this. Look, in order to keep everything together, processed foods have to use methods to make it together. How do you make a cookie? You've got to use polyunsaturated fats, and you've got to put the, the dough in it and lots of sugar in it, and then you bake it hard so it all combines together. Otherwise, it's just going to fall apart. It's intentional, except you don't know about it. 
You don't know about it. You think it's just fine. Those cookies are just fine. Here we go, cooking method. Broiling a piece of beef gives you that much. Roasting, grilling. Now, come on, what did you learn? You um... Take poultry. You're making your chicken. I heard a lot of chicken lovers in this audience. All right, you chicken lovers, go ahead and roast your, roast, your, roast your chicken and see what happens. Pan frying is also not good. Poaching is the best. But how many of you know how to post chicken? But you can make a chicken curry. That's OK. That's like poaching. So you'd rather make a chicken curry than roast it. So now when you go to your favorite friend's or restaurant, you got to be careful how, you, how they cook that chicken. You know? Salmon, same thing. You, although not as much as poultry. So why, why is that? Why is that? Why is salmon less compared to this? Because poultry itself, innately, I showed you, has more polyunsaturated fats in it. The more polyunsaturated fats they are, the more they can interact. The more saturated fats the food has, the less they can interact. Eggs, a fried egg, 2,700 versus 90, when you poach it. Now, if you're going to make if you're going to make um, scrambled eggs, you do it very lightly. You just put it in there. As soon as that white has become solidified and it's OK, just take it off the plate and put it in your plate. See? So you light it. Don't wait. Don't brown it. Don't. Once you see browning, once you see browning, that's all advanced glycation end products. The bread. Take your bread. The crust. Fantastic, right? Full of advanced glycation end products. Because they're browned. <coughs> the ancients were very smart. In the royal families, they used to cut this crust out and only make sandwiches with the white portions inside. They were smart. They knew something we didn't know. See? Next, grains. Now look at this. Chips, biscuits, very high. Grilled eggplant, very high. Evaporated milk, very high. So these are all processed. Processed foods are no good for you. The worst but the oils are with polyunsaturated fats because they break down. I told you that earlier on. They break down. They break down into an aldehyde. I told you how aldehydes participate in advanced glycation end products. That was one of my first slides I showed you. So polyunsaturated fats break down into aldehydes, easily oxidized in the body, very easily oxidized. And from the best to the worst is olive oil, peanut, canola, corn, soy, sunflower, safflower. Now, when you go to your favorite restaurant, maybe tonight, you never know. Are you going to, how do you know which oil they used? How do you know? They used the cheapest oil possible, right? And that's going to be either safflower, sunflower, or soy oil. I'll tell you that right now. Right now. And they're going to put lots of that in your food. The best temperature for frying is only 180 to 190 degrees centigrade. So you've got to watch your temperatures when you're cooking. Avoid the smoke point, because it breaks the fats and the triglycerols into free fatty acids and glycerol. The free, the free fatty acids broken away from the, from the backbone, the three of them, when they break away, they react more easily with everything in the body. Acrylin is a toxic substance produced at high temperatures. Bottom line, what did you learn today? Avoid high temperatures. Avoid baking. Avoid frying. Avoid grilling. Avoid browning. Avoid make it with water, moist, moist heating. Right? You'll produce less uh, less of these advanced glycation end products. Reheating oil very bad for you, right? Because you're going to create more trans fats also, and you're going to break down the oil. See, it creates free fatty acids, and it lowers the smoke point even further. So once you've heated that oil, next time you heat it, the smoke point is lower. And the next time you heat it again, that same oil, because you, you kept it. You kept it. You, you, know, you, cannot, you cannot get rid of that oil. Am I right? Am I right or wrong? So there you go. All right, bad oils for frying. Soybean, corn, canola, concern. So what are you going to use? What are you going to use? Ghee is the best way. Trans fats are created by repeated things. So you're going to use ghee. You can use coconut oil. You can use some avocado oil. Now, 
Let's look at the smoke points. For butter, it's 150, coconut 150, peanut 150, lard 190, olive oil 200, ghee 250, and avocado. You see? Very high smoke points. That's why ghee will not break down. Smoke points mean you can heat ghee up to 250. It's not going to break down. All these others will break down real fast. And you can see it in your pan. When you put it in there, you put a piece of butter, and it's all smoky, and it's already changed. It's already breaking down. Epidemic today is because of our increased intake of vegetable oils, mostly due to processed food industry. So you can avoid these by just not eating processed foods. Anything that's ready-made, anything that comes in a packet, anything that needs to be opened, anything with a barcode, anything that comes in a box, just get rid of it. <laughs> just get rid of it. This epidemic is because we not only eating the wrong stuff and we're eating too frequently. So my solution is always eating the right food. And number two, if you cut the meals down to one meal a day, which is what I tell most of my patients to do, I've already reduced my intake of ages by how much? Two thirds, right? Because two meals are gone. Right there. So do more fasting. You get less poison because eating is dangerous. <laughs> now, polyunsaturated come in two flavors, right? They come in omega-6 and omega-3. Omega-3 is found in fish oils and in some vegetable foods, but omega-6 is found in all the vegetable seed oils. And high levels of arachidonic acid are very bad for you. So this ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 is very important. It should be one to one. You get that on your advanced lipid panel. And you can tell how much omega-3 is in your body. You need omega-3 because omega-3 and 6 compete for the same enzyme to go to the next step. So when you have a lot of omega-6, you don't give omega-3 a chance to be metabolized in your body. Omega-3 is very important. It's anti-inflammatory. Omega-6 is pro-inflammatory. You need that. You must know your ratio. Do you know your omega-3, omega-6 ratio? You don't. Why not? Next time you go to your family doctor, you ask him, Doc, I need to know my omega-3, omega-6 ratio. He might shake his head, but ask him. So composition of cell membranes in all the organs, LDL, WBC, all of them get affected by omega-6, linoleic acid. It goes into every cell. And I just told you how long it stays in your fat pads. How many days did I say? 600 days. Boy, you're smart, guys. So <laughs> six. you want something to stay in your body for 600 days? Heck, I don't even want anything to stay in me for one day. Next day, it should be out. Composition of cell membranes. Linoleic acid is found in all the seed oils. Normal levels used to be less than 20. Now it's less than 30 because everyone's got it. In 1990, OK, this trans fat stuff all started. I don't know, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because you all know you're not supposed to have Crisco and you're not supposed to have all these polyunsaturated fats, right? Um, they did it because it can preserve the food for long shelf life. Are you interested in the food shelf life? I'm not. The ancients were smart. They go shopping every day. But nowadays, we buy stuff, and you want to still have it on your shelf two months later. Well, the only way that food's still going to be there two months later is if it's full of omega-6 and other preservatives in it. That's why you can buy any processed food, I promise you, put it in your kitchen, leave it open over there, two months later, it'll still look the same. If it goes rotten, eat it. Because it doesn't have preservatives in it, it's good. It's nature's way. <laughs> so they cause vasoconstriction, leukocyte adhesion, platelet activation. So this, this is a huge problem. This, why am I interested in all this? Because these poor patients come in here, they get coronary artery disease, and then they keep getting it, keep getting it, keep getting it, and every year they get another stent. Well, they get bypass, and even after bypass, and bypass doesn't make you live more, longer. Stents don't make you live longer. You take away your angina. 
But if you really look at the details of the, of the studies, they take away your angina. Sure, sure they do. They take away your angina. And they may help reduce arrhythmias, and they may help preserve left ventricular function. But there's no robust data to show that, oh, yeah, yeah, these things actually make you live longer. What's actually making you live longer is what you're learning today about your chemistry, about your metabolism. So let's talk about uh, uh, these things. Oh, yeah, oh, may, K2 deficiency. Now, you know, I talk a lot about K2 deficiency. And one reason why you get vitamin K2 deficiency is because of seed oils. Seed oils cause endogenous vitamin K2 deficiency, which causes calcification of the arteries okay, and osteopenia. In women who eat a lot of vegetable oils, they get osteopenia living in Florida. Why do they get osteopenia? Because they have lack of, uh, of vitamin K2. See? And dihydro K1 inhibits testosterone production. Heck, every other guy that comes to my office he says on the way out, by the way, my testosterone levels are low. Can you help me? What's all that all about? Lots of reasons. That's a whole new topic I can talk about, including things like high fructose diets, high glycemic index foods, ages, all these things lower your testosterone levels. And you can improve your testosterone levels just by making simple changes. There's not a single patient whose testosterone level has not gone up if he abided by these changes. Get rid of his fatty liver. Get rid of his insulin resistance. Get rid of his high blood pressure through diet. Get rid of the belly and the de novo lipogenesis that's occurring in the liver all the time. Right? De novo lipogenesis. What is that? That means new fat formation. But I don't eat fat. Where did that fat come from? It's from insulin and sugar. Let's get converted to that fat. And that fat is bad fat, made up of all these horrible things. And then they get, oxygenated, uh, they get oxidated. And then now you have a real perfect storm for advanced glycation end products. So phytosterols I did mention in the beginning. I'm showing you this slide because these oils have a lot of phytosterols. These phytosterols mimic your cholesterol levels, and they replace your cholesterol in your body. And when they do that, it's not good physiology for you. You want your cholesterol. You don't want plants cholesterol in you. Why would you want a plant's cholesterol in you? But this was sold to you as a health product by having margarine with high phytosterols. Remember those that you buy the flora and all those makes that you used to make with phytosterols in it. Phytosterols are no good. So let me just move on because we're running out of time. So I'm going to show you some studies, just a few, just a couple. So this one was a the Sydney Diet Heart Study. What they did in this study, this is a very interesting study. In this study, they took men who already uh, had a heart attack, right? And they took them and they gave them corn oil, very healthy corn oil, vegetable oil, versus regular diet, including lots of saturated fats and everything. They did this in Australia. And they looked at the follow-up data. And they found that there was a 62% increased risk of dying if you're on the corn oil. I hope I said that right. 62% increased risk of dying on corn oil. So the study was completed in 1973, but it was only published in 2013 because it was an inconvenient truth. <clears throat> then, let me show you another. Oh, so here it is. So basically, this is just a rundown. LA means linoleic acid, right? That's the bad one, right? Linoleic acid. We don't want linoleic acid. Right? Linolenic is an omega-3. So don't get lost in the details. The bottom line is linoleic acid is omega-6. Bad boy. That's a bad boy. But in these studies, it clearly showed that cholesterol actually went down in the corn oil group. Look, cholesterols, p-value 0, 0.01, went down, minus, went down. The other group, they're on saturated, but their cholesterols went up. The LDLs went up, but they didn't die. So what are we trying to do here? So you want to look good with a nice number in your casket? <laughs> yeah. So 
This was the same, uh, in the same study, the uh, breakdown. This shows you the cholesterol. I can go into these in detail if you had more time. I mean, look at the cholesterol. In the intervention group, it went down to 243 instead of 281. P-value was significant, whereas in the control group, there was no significant drop. These are just further breakdowns. Look at this study. This was a very interesting study, the Minnesota Connery study. Now, when you do a dietary study, if I asked you what you ate yesterday, would you remember it? But I give you a survey. Uh, let's do a study on food consumption and how it, you're not going to remember. Half the time, you are just bluffing. You just, you are. So those studies are not very good studies. But in this study, what they did is these were all inmates in the in a hospital. They're all in the mental asylum. So they had, in this study, they had 7,000 patients all over Minnesota. They had a lot of inmates, or sick people, rather, I should say. And they, they could control what they ate. So one group, they gave them seed oils. And the other group, they gave them whatever else they wanted to eat, whatever you wanted, you know, meaning normal saturated food, normal diet. But this group can only have the food looked the same, tasted the same. But these was made from vegetable oils. These was made from lard, lard, lard. Beautiful, very nice. The stuff that M McDonald's used to fry the French fries in until they got forced to change to vegetable oils. But in order to do that now and preserve it, they had to add more ingredients to it and change the whole thing. And anyway, so then anyway, they did the study. And what the study showed, this study showed that those who are on seed oils, that group, died prematurely. They had a very high incidence of death. And this study was also completed in 1973, but only published in 2016. And when the, when the guys were asked, how come you didn't publish this? this well, because the results were not what we quite expected. It's an inconvenient truth again. Revaluation of this, OK, this is a revaluation. So look at the conclusion. Available evidence in randomized control trials show that replacement of saturated fat, which is what you all taught to do, replace your saturated fat with linoleic acid, will lower cholesterol. And it does. I showed you that. It lowers your cholesterol, hmm? but does not support the hypothesis that translate to a lower risk and or cause mortality. So you cannot do this. You cannot do it. So I can give you something that'll bring your LDL really low. Try some arsenic or some stuff like that. Uh, it'll come right down. I'll give you some nice poison. It'll come down. Now, associations of this, this, this. OK, oh, in this, well, actually, I'm going to skip this one. Basically, came to the same conclusion that moving to vegetable oils did not improve outcomes. This is a fascinating study. The Women's Heart Initiative said, now you know how much this costed? Almost, just over half a billion dollars, I believe. It's one of the largest studies ever done, the Women's Health Initiative. And when they broke down the studies in this one, they showed 48,000 females that those who were on a low fat diet, low saturated fat diet, they looked at those women. Those who are on a low saturated fat diet, the diet that you all want to be on, huh, had a 47 to 61% increased risk of having heart disease on a low fat diet. Now that goes completely against the grain, right? That's not what you've been taught. Because it's the polyunsaturated fats that gets you. It's not the saturated fats. So when you're on low saturated fat diet, you're going to be eating more carbs, more polyunsaturated fats, more ready-made foods, and all these things because you're all saturated. Now, saturated fat intake in the United States since 1940 is pretty much flat. It hasn't changed much. Yet coronary artery disease death rates are going up and up and up and up. Why? Saturated fat didn't go up. What went up was polyunsaturated fats, seed oils. They went up. Sugar intake. Let me tell you something about sugar. Sugar did go up a little bit. But you know what? Since World War II, sugar intake hasn't increased drastically. Not in keeping with the slope that you're seeing for coronary artery disease. That is what I think, from all the literature that I've seen and all this, I think that polyunsaturated fats are the new sugar. The new sugar. 
That's where your risk really is today. So that doesn't mean you should go out and eat sugar. I'm just saying that this is the real problem that we have right now. Why are we still not getting better? We're watching our sugar. We're watching all this stuff. We're still not getting better. It's the vegetable oils. It's the vegetable oils. So this was uh, the Women's Health Initiative study. Over 8.1 years, you see, looking that increased intake of vegetables, fruits, and grains did not significantly reduce the risk of heart disease, stroke, or cardiovascular disease in women. It didn't, because the problem is not that. The problem is we're eating the wrong fats, wrong sugars, plus we're eating processed things. We're forcing these molecules together. Nature did not want these molecules together and force them under high heat, and we are producing those ages in our body. So I hope that today you all learned about advanced glycation end products and why what you do to your food in your kitchen, destroying it, in the cooking process is really going to kill you. You may get nice food and destroy it, make it into a poison. You're converting it in your kitchen. Stop converting good food into poison in your kitchen. Pay attention to this. Watch your cooking methods. Now, if you take a piece of meat and you marinate it in lemon and vinegar, it reduces the amount of advanced glycation end products. Now, you all know that marinating is very good. Now you know why. Eating certain foods with certain types of condiments are very good. There was a slide earlier on which I passed over which showed the natural agents that prevent advanced glycation end products. There are some artificial ones as well, but the natural ones, because they prevent that, pro that interaction. So watch your food. Eat more garnishing with, with herbs and use vinegar, lemon, don't overcook the food, and you're gonna have a much healthier food on your plate. And uh, understand that it's not just glucose, it's glucose and fats, and fats are in every cell of your body. And make sure that they, can, they have the right fat, no seed oils, no seed oils. You need saturated fat in your diet. Okay, so I'm gonna stop right there. Very long lecture. Thank you. Oh, great question, pressure cooking. Now, pressure cooking, yes, because all you're doing is increasing the barometric pressure inside the cooker, but it's still steam, and steam cannot go more than 100 degrees, right? So you're fine with that. No, you're not. Does it come out blackened? Does it come out brown? No. As long as you're not burning it in there, you're fine. Any moist heat is good. So all lentils need to be pressure cooked because you get rid of all the lectins in it. Hmm? You get rid of all the lectins. Also, whatever you put in a pressure cooker, you should soak it the night before as well, because that also lessens the amount of lectins in it. Yeah. Ghee. So ghee is the, the choice. The, the, the ghee for vagar and for cooking should be ghee. Ghee is your oil that you should go for, and you should make ghee at home from grass-finished butter, and that's it. And the second part was the uh, dried fruit. Dried fruit. Okay, so dried. dried food. You know, you can consume so much dried food. If I gave you those real fruit like that, you'd never be able to eat it. It's all empty calories. It's going to get a lot of sugar in it. Dried food is not a good idea. You should what not. Eat. Almonds and walnuts. Almonds and walnuts. Okay, good question. Walnuts have oil in it that rapidly becomes rancid. So your oils that are in the walnuts, you've got to be careful. They very easily become rancid. So I, walnuts, you can have just a few. The bad ones are actually what you think is almonds. Almonds have a lot of oxalates in it, and most of the almonds and nuts that you guys are eating, if you look at the box, it'll tell you it's got cottonseed oil. So they put cotton seed oil, they douse it in, and then they put it in the oven, and they roast it. So if you're going to have nuts, try to eat raw nuts. And if you're going to roast it, roast it yourself at home so you know what you're putting in it. But nuts should not be roasted. It, what the high temperature roasting causes advanced glycation end products. So all those nuts have them eat raw nuts, which is what we were taught back home. Thank you. Also, also like all the knowledge, like you soaked almonds overnight. Yes. 
you soak almonds overnight, you will be reducing the amount of oxalates in it and other lectins. Hi. So vegan diet. Vegan diet in general is very hard and not a very healthy diet. Now, if you look at it strictly from the medical standpoint, the most nutrient-dense food is actually meat, chicken, fish. So vegan diets can be done, but it's hard work. And you've got to make sure you're getting the full complement of minerals, but more importantly, vitamin B12. You've got to be, make sure that you're getting a lot of vitamin B12 in a vegan diet. So veganism also, unfortunately, has a lot of processed foods in it. So a lot of vegans come to me, and when I ask them, give me a list of all the foods you eat, it's all processed foods. So veganism is possible, but it's a tough diet to do. Vegetarianism, probably a little bit better, probably a little bit better because you are allowed some animal products. But again, you know, if you're going to do these diets, you really need to get your blood tested. You really need to make sure you're not eating processed foods. Make sure you're doing nutritional assessment. These are nutritional assessment tests you can do. It's a blood test. What amino acids are missing? Which antioxidants are missing? Which minerals are missing in my body? Which vitamins are missing in my body? And you need to do that. The people who I see that have the best profile are those who are actually eating some meat because they, they, have, they get just about everything. They eat liver, they eat, um, they eat meat. So it's, a, it, it's, it's different. It's not what you want to hear, but it is true that the best medically directed diet is actually one that contains meat in it. So you can do vegetarianism, but I told you already, 70% of Indians are vegetarians and they have a very high incidence of coronary artery disease. Why? Because they're eating the wrong foods, they're eating processed foods as well. And the dairy food? Oh, dairy. So dairy, dairy, you know, okay. Fermented dairy, hands down, the best thing you can do is ferment dairy. And you should probably have that every day. Because in the fermentation process, you're getting rid of lactose as well, and you're generating a lot of postbiotics, and you're getting probiotics in it as well. So the ancients always told us, you don't have to drink milk when you're an adult, but you can have dai, you know, the, you can have yogurt, which is very healthy. So I have no problems with that. But don't drink milk. You don't need to be drinking milk. Now, there's also other caveats about dairy, which we can go into one day, because goat milk is much better. Goat cheese is much better than cow's milk. Uh, A2 is better than A1. Um, and if you're really concerned about milk, there's a test you can do which breaks it down into which kinds of milk products you can and cannot have. So some people, they do do that blood test. One question. Okay, the, the fruits that you want to avoid are high sugary fruits because they and low fiber in them. For example, grapes. Grapes have hardly any fiber in them. They're full of sugar. So you have a handful of grapes. Your sugar level is going to bounce right up. Okay? Now, his may not, but your physiology is different, right? So, so high glycemic index fruits are like grapes. Um, then mangoes will drive your sugar up very high. It's the fructose. You see, fructose, fructose is metabolized only in one organ in your body, basically. It's your liver. And it gets converted into fat right away. And then it produces uric acid as well. It produces also the advanced glycation end products. Fructose is only supposed to be consumed in the fall, ready to go into hibernation. But you don't go into hibernation. <laughs> so why do you need something that prepares you for hibernation? So leave it for the bears. So I say you, you can have some fruit but eat it seasonally, seasonally. And eat foods, I mean fruit, in its original state. So don't juice it. Because when you juice that thing, you've, you basically put it in that thing of and now all that fiber is gone. Basically, it gets cut into tiny, tiny pieces. So now, when it goes in, the K cells in the duodenum sees all that stuff coming in, produces a bunch of insulin, and that insulin is going to make you get a fatty liver and gain a lot of weight. So you must always eat your food, never drink your food. So do I juice? I stopped juicing many, many, many years ago. Juicing is unnatural. Because first of all, there was no power sources in the caves. They didn't have 110 volts. So there's no way we could have evolved with it. One question, Sakina.
Intimate fast, you all should be on it. <laughs> it's the natural way to live. I'm going to say that again. The natural way to live is to be doing intermittent fasting on a daily basis and more aggressive fasts intermittently to be done. That means every day you're supposed to become glucocentric and then ketocentric. Glucocentric, because that's how you're going to get that turnover of your fat cells unless you want them to stay there for 600 days. You getting the idea? You have to do this on a daily basis because ketogenesis is going to give you mito, uh, uh, mitogenesis. It's going to give you brain-derived neurotropic fat. It's going to give you stem cell mobilization. You have to do intermittent fasting every day. Your insulin sensitivity will be really, really good if you do intermittent. Now, what kind of intermittent fasting? 18-6 yeah, to start with. If you can't do 18-6, then try. You can do 12 hours. Better than that, after you do it, is to do 24 hours. So if you just eat once a day, oh mad, eating once a day. Now, unless you're pregnant and you, you know, you're a growing child, then of course that's a different story. And then, depending on your condition, if you have diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, dementia, uh, dyslipidemia, these conditions, then you need to do more fasting. That means you do this, and on top of that, every two, three weeks, Give me a three-day water fast. Three-day water fast. Three days of water fast, every two, three. Until all that visceral fat is gone, the stomach is gone, the fatty liver is gone, then you can start going back to either OMAD or 18.6. If you do intermittent fasting for medical conditions, it's, the, it's better than any drug, hands down. Yeah, we use ghee for everything. And if you're going to do any frying, then I prefer that you use the avocado oil because okay. that's a very high, high uh, yeah. okay. smoke point. Yeah. So nobody says that. Nobody says. Breakfast is the one meal you can afford to miss. And who said that? Kellogg's said that. <laughs> <laughs> they want to sell it. Cereal <laughs> on the list. OK, so there's two types of fasting. You can do waterless fasting as well. I don't advise that on my patients. Um, I haven't studied the details on that, so I can't even comment too much. All I know that if you become dehydrated, then it actually causes more neurohormonal activation inside you. Your blood pressure will even go even higher because you, your body's trying to maintain its blood pressure. Catecholamines go up, your blood gets thin, your viscosity increases, all bad things. So I always tell people, no, you must drink water. And the data that I have that shows that this chemistry that I'm talking about, that gets better, you get ketogenesis, you get all the things I mentioned, are all on water fasts. So I would not say, I would not advise, because you get dry, your kidneys may pack up and you get acute tubular necrosis, I would not advise dehydration. One dehydration is not healthy. Here's the harvest. Black coffee is infinitely better because milk will break your fast because it still has some uh, sugar in it. So if you really want to do a fast, it's black tea, black coffee, a little bit of MCT oil, uh, green tea, black, uh, that's it. But you, you know, if you absolutely have to put something in your milk, I mean in your black coffee, you can put a little bit of heavy whipping cream, just a little, because that is so fatty and very little calories, so you're not really breaking your fast. So you can put a little bit of heavy whipping cream. It also gives you more satiation. You feel more, you know, your hunger goes away because you had that. But what, what preferably half and half. half, and half you go heavy whipping, heavy whipping cream, or MCT oil. All our ways. We had one more question. You know what MCT oil is, right? MCT is made from coconuts, right? Medium chain triglycerides. It satiates you, and it, it's a fuel for ketogenesis. So now you're burning that in form of ketones. Ketones are wonderful.
They're absolutely wonderful. Yeah. If you really want to know how you're doing, you all should go out and buy some keto sticks for yourself and measure your urine ketones. A lot more than when you're not fasting because now you're not getting water from your food as well so normally if you have six glasses you should have 12 so you just double up whatever you normally have just double it that's what you should be doing good no, thank you doctor what okay terrible <laughs> that's a bar, that's a one word terrible okay i'm going to tell you a few things next time you go to, you go to your house take out your oatmeal carton and look on it and you know what you're going to find polyunsaturated fats in it you're going to i guarantee you'll have polyunsaturated fats in it no more number two you know how many oats it takes to make a glass of oatmeal uh, or oat uh, milk so, same thing with soy it's all very unnatural. It's an unnatural food. Oats also are very high in oxalates. So they have sugar, they have the bad fats, and they have oxalates. That's why I don't use oat, oat uh, stuff. It's not a good idea. Stay away. Same thing with soy. Soy milk? Who needs soy milk? But regular oats is good, right? Regular oats, a small amount. If you eat it, that's OK. If you don't have kidney stones, arthritis, and sugar problems, then it's okay. Or, or glucose intolerance or things like that, then it's okay. It's all right. What? Artificial citizens. There's an artificial. Stop. He's still trying. He's still trying, God. Okay, so he wants to know the science. The science is that it won't hurt you, but it'll kill your bacteria in your gut. So what happens is that your microbiome consumes it. Now you change the microbiome. So the whole ecosystem in your gut has been changed. And number two is the sweetness of the taste. There's a cephalic phase of insulin secretion and your dopamine center also. So you mess with all that where your body is still making insulin even though it's, it's artificial sweetener and it does cause problems. So my answer is absolutely not. No artificial sweetener. The only one I do allow in some people, especially if you're desperate, is a little bit of monk fruit. You can have monk fruit, just a little bit. Otherwise, don't do it. Which is? Gore? Gore? No. That's basically molasses. It's still the same thing, except it's got more minerals, but still not a good idea. It's still sugar. Yeah. Who, who, who invented sugar? The Indians did. Yeah. Uh, who invented sugar is Indians from gore. Because gore would turn bad after a while. So they couldn't transport it everywhere. So then he made crystals. And then he gave it to the Persians who came. We took it to Persia. Persians sold it to the Romans and the Greeks. And they gave it to the Europeans. And now the whole world became addicts to sugar, right? Yeah. Probiotic capsules, very good question. They are for the gut bacteria. The problem is that some of them get killed in the acid of the stomach, but they are still helpful because some will go down further. They can repopulate the gut if you need those, but the best way to bring them in, your, your good bacteria, is to give them food. Wherever you have food, everybody comes. All colors, races, religions, they all come wherever there's food. Same thing. In your gut, they all come there. So give yourself lots of fiber. Give yourself a lot of fi uh, polyphenols, phytonutrients, then the good bacteria come. Because you see, your appendix is a storehouse of all your keystone species. So even if you did a stool test, for example, and it shows that certain species are missing, the way to bring them back or grow them in, because you want the right ecosystem is to feed them right. Now, there are some cases where I do give probiotic, but they're very specific strains. For example, Acomancia mycinophilia or Lactobacillus ruteri, DS, number, number, and I have it all written down. But those are only for specific cases. But as a general rule, if you want a probiotic, eat fermented foods. Look, you eat kefir. 
you're going to get 16 strains of bacteria in it. Regular yogurt will have six to eight. You eat sauerkraut. You eat pickled things. You eat balsamic vinegar. You're going to eat some, drink some, some uh, kombucha or, or lassi every day or something like that. That's much better for you. But the capsules, not really, right? Right now, we haven't reached that phase yet. We haven't reached it that. We are not that sophisticated yet. If you have a leaky gut, then it's not only gluten-free, it should be wheat-free. Because gluten are only two molecules out of 600 different proteins that are found in wheat. As a general rule, if I was going to tell you all to skip one grain, it's going to be wheat. We are not supposed to have wheat. None of us are supposed to have wheat. We should stay away from wheat. Wheat is very, very, very bad, bad for you. Wheat. Just remember, your answer to your question is wheat. Wheat is an enemy. You shouldn't. If you're getting, okay, if you have the following symptoms. If you have autoimmune disease, anyone with autoimmune disease, they should not be eating wheat. If you have joint problems, you have lupus, you have rheumatoid arthritis, you have um, even thyroid. Cor thyroid Hashimoto's, you, you shouldn't be eating wheat at all. Just cut it out, cut it out. Even diabetes, you should cut it out. And do that as a trial, just become wheat free. Very healthy to be wheat free. If you have a fatty liver, you can't lose weight, just look, get cut out the wheat. So when next time we go to doctor, If you, cutting out wheat means you go to, you go to bajri or juar, you know, and mix it up a little bit and make, make that, you, much healthier. Bread? Bread. Bread, no bread. Bread, leave it to the British. Ha, 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 ha.